Praise the Lord. We rise up as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for our regular members who are here, our leaders, our workers, our members. Thank you for the faithfulness they demonstrate every time. And I pray that everyone will be rewarded appropriately in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for invitees who are coming here for the first time. Lord, I pray that the truth of the word will enlighten everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. I will pray that today none of us will be left out of the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Our children, our youths, our students, our fathers and mothers, our leaders and everyone. We're asking, Lord, that everyone will sense and know and feel and receive and possess of the blessings of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our eyes of understanding. Amen. Bless your people. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're considering we're coming to John chapter 15. And today as we look at John chapter 15... We're reading from verses 1 through to 6. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and it is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. As we look at uh, what we are studying today, you'll find that the Lord Jesus mentioned fruitfulness much in this chapter it talks about bearing fruit that's in verse 2 and it talks about bearing much fruit that's in verse 5 and as you go on in the whole chapter you'll see that it mentions fruit fruit every time not only that it mentions abiding it says you abide in me because i'm the true vine and you are the branches and the, as the branches are attached to the stem of the vine, so that the branches can bear fruit, so you are attached unto me, connected with me, and you are linked up with me, and as you keep on abiding, then you'll keep on growing. And not only that, he mentions the uh, situation where the branches are not bearing fruit. And if the branches are not bearing fruit, it is not the fault of the vine. It is not the fault of the stem. It's uh, the responsibility of that uh, branch. And then it says God, the Almighty God, the Father, will do something about that. As we come back to verse 1, and it says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And my Father is the Osman man. I need to remind you. That Jesus Christ was now talking to his own disciples alone. He's uh, come out of the public. Actually, from chapter 13, you'll find uh, he was inside with his own disciples. And there was some, somebody there who was not really having the same heart, the same mind with them. That's Judas Iscariot. And in that chapter 13, Judas Iscariot had gone out. And so Christ is now with only his disciples. These are people that have known the Lord. These are people that are truly converted, the citizens of the kingdom. Their names had been written in the book of life. He had called them out of the world. 
and now they belong totally and completely unto him. These last few days, the last week of the passion that he is before the betrayal and crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, he kept himself indoors with these who were saved. He kept himself with these who had been cleansed. He kept himself with these people who had come out of the world and they entirely belong to him. These people that are recognized and known by heaven and from heaven. And now he's talking to them about the necessity of continuing to abide and continuing to bear fruit. And I was telling these believers, true believers, real children of God, real saved people, he said, you know what? If you do not bear fruit, the Father will do something about this. These uh, disciples, because they were Israelites, they understood uh, about the vine. Because the message of the vine wasn't anything strange to the Israelites. In the natural, in the physical, they had farms. And in their farmlands, they had vines. They had vineyards. And they planted these vines so that the vines will bring forth fruit in the spiritual, the whole of the children of Israel as a nation. I'd be referred to as the vine or the vineyard of the Lord. And something happened in the Old Testament that those vines, they stopped bearing fruit. They were not bearing the right kind of fruit. And God said they became degenerate vine. Let's come to the Old Testament to see the background of uh, the vine as Jesus Christ instructed and spoke to his own disciples and the same way he's speaking to us today. Look at Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5 so you understand the background to what Jesus Christ was teaching them, instructing them about and opening their minds of understanding, transferring the knowledge of the vine, the vineyard from the Old Testament and transferring that to the new kingdom of God. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill and he faced it. And he gathered out the stones thereof, and he planted each with the choicest vine, and built a tower on the, in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. You'll see whenever there was a vineyard, the expectation is that there'll be fruitfulness. But in the case of the children of Israel as a nation and in the individual families and their individual personal lives, instead of bearing the right kind of fruit, they were bearing wild grapes. Look at verse 3 now and now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done? more to my vineyard that I have not done in it. It says, wherefore when I looked that it shall bring forth graves, brought it forth wild graves. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the edge thereof. You see, there's a consequence. Because the children of Israel were not bearing the right kind of fruit, God said, don't you think that your favor will keep on flowing and the goodness of God will keep on flowing. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'm going to take away the hedge thereof and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof and shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. You see, that's the knowledge the Lord Jesus Christ was transferring now to the lives of his own disciples. You bear fruit, favor will continue. Grace will continue. Mercy will continue. The goodness of God will continue. The relationship will continue. But if you don't bear fruit, my father is the husband man. 
my father is the vine dresser and you will take away the branches that are not bearing fruit look at that verse 6 and I will lay each waste it shall not be it shall not be pruned nor deed but there shall come up briars and thorns and I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it for the vineyard of the Lord of course is the house of Israel you see that the vineyard of the Lord of course is the children the house of Israel and the men of Judah is pleasant plant and he looked for judgment he looked for justice he looked for righteousness but behold oppression for righteousness but behold a cry and Jeremiah tells us the same thing about these people. In fact, Jeremiah now qualifies them as he talks about the kind of vine that these uh, children of Israel became. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 2, reading from verse 21. It says in verse 21 of Jeremiah chapter 2, it says, Yet I had planted thee, a noble vine, holy a right seed. Now then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a straight vine unto me. And what the Lord expected that they'll bring the right kind of fruit, heavenly fruit. They'll bring the right kind of fruit that will make them different from all the other nations around. They were not doing that. And they became as bad. They even became worse than the nations around them. And he said they became a degenerate vine. That's what Jesus was talking about. He said, you are my disciples. Do not repeat the same error and the same mistake and do not go into the same backsliding as the whole nation of Israel went to and they became degenerate and they became reprobate and they became rejected from the, from the sight of the Lord. As Isaiah spoke about Israel as a vine, so Jeremiah spoke about Israel as a vine and then in Ezekiel chapter 19, Ezekiel also spoke about them as a vine. And so you will understand that what Jesus Christ was telling his own disciples in this closed door meeting, what he was telling them in this inner circle instruction, it wasn't something strange at all. Israel became degenerate. Israel became hardened. Israel became uncircumcised in heart. And he said, you are my disciples and I have cleansed you I've washed you, I've changed you, I've transformed you, and you must have that same, uh, you must not have that same attitude. You mustn't become degenerate. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 19. Ezekiel chapter 19, I'm reading here from verse 10. Ezekiel chapter 19, reading from verse 10. Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood planted by the waters she was fruitful she was past tense and full of branches by reason of many waters the waters of the love of God the waters of the faithfulness of God the waters of the care of God the waters of the compassion of God God just surrounded them with great blessings and they were fruitful in verse 11 and she had strong uh, rods for the scepters of them that bear room and her, her stature was exalted among the thick branches and she appeared in her height with the multitudes of her branches but it said uh, when they were responding to the love of God they were high they were great higher than all the nations around them more righteous than all the nations around them it said but she was plucked up in the in fury, and she was cast down to the uh, to the ground. And it says, and the east wind dried up her fruit, and her strong rods were broken and withered, and the fire consumed them. You know what Jesus was saying? I have been with you. All the time I've been with you, I have kept you in the love of God. I have kept you to be true. I've kept you to be faithful. Only the one that is lost is the son of perdition. 
that the scripture ought be fulfilled. Now I am going away, and you must remain as faithful as you were when I was physically with you, so that you will not turn out to become like the children of Israel. We're coming to Hosea chapter 10, the vine. Hosea chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. Israel is an empty vine. By the time you come to Osea, it says Israel is an empty vine. There's no fruit. There's no good fruit. The fruit of the grace of God was no more there empty. And the fruit of the love of God was no more there empty. And the fruit of the ministry of the prophets to the nation of Israel, uh, those fruits were no more there. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself it's no more thinking about god it's saying he's not living a kind of a self-centered life a selfish life it's a self-consuming life because he bring it forth fruit unto himself according to the multitude of his fruit he has increased the altars according to the goodness of his land they have made goodly images look at verse 2 their heart is divided their heart is no more totally centered on god and totally giving to god it says their heart is divided divided instead of loving the lord with all their heart all their soul and all their mind their heart is divided instead of giving all the glory to god and to god alone their heart is divided instead of seeking the goodness of the people and the godliness that god demands their heart is divided instead of focusing their attention their affection on things above and not on things on earth their heart is divided instead of thinking about heaven and walking for heaven and doing the will of God with all their heart all their soul their heart is divided God a little me a little and God uh, the world a little and then righteousness a little it says their heart is divided now shall they be found faulty and then it says you shall break down their altars and shall spoil their images. Now to the children of Israel, to the nation of Israel, Christ came and he began to reveal the way of truth and the way of righteousness and the way of repentance. He said, I came to call the sinners to repentance. That whole nation had another opportunity again, an opportunity to become a choice vine, a precious vine, and a favored vine before the Lord. And the Lord spent with them three and a half years. But you know the result? Let me show you the result in chapter 13 of Luke. Luke chapter 13, I'm reading now from verse 5. In Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 5, I tell you nay, but except she repent, it shall all likewise perish. He was not talking to the nation. And was saying the nation that had become a degenerate vine. They, need, they needed to come fully to repentance. And he said, except you repent as a nation, except you repent in the leadership, the Sanhedrin and those the religious leaders, and then to let that repentance flow down to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, except that happened, he says, you likewise perish but who are the vine look at you look at verse 6 he speak also this parable a certain man had a fig a fig tree planted in the in his vineyard that's the vineyard of the lord and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard behold these three years that's uh, the time the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to them as the high priest. He spoke to them as the prophet that will come like unto Moses. He spoke to them as the king. Behold your king. He spoke to them as the lamb of God. He spoke to them as a teacher come from heaven all these three years. He says, these three years I come seeking fruit. That's all he's seeking from the vine, from the vineyard, seeking fruit on the fig tree and find none cut it down why compareth it the ground and he answering said unto him lord let it alone 
this year also till I shall dig about it and dunk it. It's saying I've spent three years and then part of the fourth year will be spent. Another six months will be spent to have them so that they might repent, they might turn, they might seek the face of the Lord again and they might receive the grace of God and the grace for righteousness in their lives. Let me dig around, let me poach my nor, and let me see how to take care of them more and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. And you know the story, eventually Christ told them, I leave your house for you desolate. There wasn't going to be any change. And now since the nation had failed, the Lord was now facing his own disciples because a new nation was going to come up. The nation of the children of Israel. A holy nation and a righteous priesthood was now going to come up. That's why he was now talking to them and saying, I am the true vine. All those other vineyards about Israel, about Judah, about Jerusalem, they're false. All those ones, they're rejected. Look up to me now. I am the true vine and my father is the Osman man. Every branch in me, all those who are attached to me, all those who are converted by me, all those who are connected with me, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, that's the repetition of the failure of the nation of Israel. The Father will take him up. But every branch in me that beareth fruit, he'll purge it, he'll prune it, he'll cleanse it, he will, do, he will uh, dig around it, he'll purge manure, he'll put more grace so that he can bear more fruit. That's what we are looking at today. And the topic is the fruitfulness of abiding believers in Christ. The fruitfulness of abiding believers in Christ. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the purging and the pruning of attached branches for more fruitfulness. The, prune, the purging and the pruning of attached branches for more fruitfulness. Number two, the peril and the perdition of apostate backsliders for their fruitlessness. The peril and the perdition of apostate, of apostate backsliders for their fruitlessness. Number three, the preparation and preservation of abiding believers for much fruitfulness. The preparation and the preservation of abiding believers for much fruitfulness. Number one, number one, the purging and the pruning of attached branches for more fruitfulness. We're coming to John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. I am the true vine, and my father is the Osman man. My father is a, is a vine dresser. My father is the one taking care. He plans your salvation. He has provided your salvation. And he has maintained that salvation. It's the one that makes your link with me to be continual. The grace you enjoy is from my father. The goodness you enjoy is from my father. The witness you enjoy is, my, is from my father. The righteousness you enjoy is, my, is from my father. And the care, the compassion, and the cleansing you enjoy is from my father. Because my father is the Osman man. Don't you think I'm alone? He sent me. And he's given you to me. And he has kept you with me. Me. And he says, every branch in me that beareth no fruit, he taketh away. And then he says, and every branch, every branch, every branch, whether small or great, every branch, whether new or long time, every branch, whether it is just budding, just coming up, or it's been there for a long time, every branch, whether it's a man, it's a woman, every believer then, every child of God then, every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit, more fruit, more fruit in your life, in Jesus' name. 
the, the question is, the question is, what kind of fruit is he talking about? Number one, the production of moral fruit. Moral fruit. He's talking about her morals. He's talking about her character. He's talking about righteousness. He's talking about holiness. The production of moral fruit. Number two, the purging for more fruit. The purging. He purges it. He purges it so that it will bring forth more fruit. Number three, the pruning for marvelous fruit. The pruning for marvelous fruit. Look at the kind of fruit he's talking about when he says he produces fruit, he's bearing fruit, and because of that, he's going to purge for more fruit. But let's look at the basic fruit he's talking about. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, the fruit he's talking about. Matthew chapter 3, there's a perception or the production of the moral fruit. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 7, it tells us in verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come into his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Look at this. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. He says, as we come to the Lord, the fruit is expecting is the fruit that is appropriate for those who have repented. Let's see the demonstration of that repentance and let us see that you are bearing the fruit of repentance. Look at uh, Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 6, we're reading from verse 18. We need to understand what the fruit is all about. It's the fruit of, it's the moral fruit of her character, of her behavior. That once you have come to the Lord, you are producing, you are producing moral fruit. Look at uh, chapter 6 of Romans. I'm reading from verse 18. In verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to unrighteousness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even now yield your members servants of to righteousness and unto holiness. Look at verse 22, but now, but now, but now, now that you are born again, now that you have repented, now that you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but now being made free from sin, ye became uh, be, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, character, morals. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. I pray that this fruit will be more abundant in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Look at Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit, the fruit. Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 22. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit... As you become born again, as you turn away from sin and you turn to the Savior, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness and faith, faithfulness of fidelity. You see that? That's the fruit he's talking about. You see that you have come to the Lord. The Lord is watching for the fruit. It's the fruit of love. You love your neighbor as yourself. You love the believers as Christ as love does. And you love God himself with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And joy, there's the joy. It's not a selfish joy. I want to be joyful. I don't care what happens to other people. That's no fruit. But the joy, the joy that is uh, joyful. And you want other people too to be joyful. You want them to be happy. And the peace, the peace you have in your heart. And the peace you are shedding abroad everywhere to all the people you are connected with. And it's talking about long suffering. That's the fruit. The fruit of repentance used to be a kind of uh, quick tempered. 
and uh, you know any little sin uh, you're angry you flare up and you're ready for a fight but now you're born again you're a child of god and you're bearing the fruit of endurance when things happen now you can be gentle when things happen now you can be slow to anger and when things happen now there's long suffering there's gentleness the way you treat other people the way you think about other people you're not cruel anymore you're not wicked anymore you're not oppressive anymore and it says goodness you're not selfish anymore because that's the fruit it's the fruit is talking about and it says the branch that bear it forth my father will purge so that you will have more fruit and the fruit of faith faithfulness and the fruit of meekness and lowliness and humility there's no pride there's no puffing up there's no uh, can't pouncing on other people and always thinking about yourself i'm great and they are small i am high and they are low and always carrying about the air of pride and looking down looking down on other people as if all the world all the people of the world are under your feet but it says now you have meekness you have humility and lowliness and it says temperance temperance that means that there's self-control you're no more being controlled by alcohol you're no more being controlled by hard drugs you're no more being controlled by you know the things that you are taking in to inject yourself it says against such there is no law and then number two here there's purging purging for more fruit isn't it wonderful that whatever fruit you have today you are going to be a more fruit i said you are going to be a more fruit how does that happen? Come back to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 2. It says, every branch in me that beareth no fruit, he taketh away. But and every branch that beareth fruit, every branch that beareth fruit, what does he do? He purges it that it may bring forth more fruit, more fruit, more fruit. Have you got to the limit of productivity in your life? Have you got to the uh, limit of progress in your life? Have you got to the limit of fruit bearing in your life? It says no, that he purges us so that you will bear more fruit. Come to look at Isaiah purging, purging. And look at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm reading him from verse 5. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're reading here from verse 5. Here is Isaiah, a prophet of God, Already he knew the Lord. Look at chapter 1. He said, come now, let us reason together. Do your sins be as scarlet? They'll be as white as snow. That man already knew the Lord. Look at chapter 2. You'll see evidence there. He was a prophet of God. Chapter 3, he was calling them, calling the nation. And he's saying that those who are righteous will eat the fruit of the righteousness. He talks about chapter 4. Now he comes to chapter 6. And he come, as he comes to chapter 6, what's he saying? He's been bearing fruit but he needed more fruit chapter 6 of Isaiah verse 5 then said I woe is me for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips you know what he's saying he said yes I know the Lord and I've seen the vision of the glory of God but I see so much similarity between me and my community I see so much resemblance between me and the people that I live around. I should be higher than them, greater than them, holier than them. But it says, woe unto me because what I am looks like the people around me are. And it says, for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, lay and having a live coal in his hand, and which he had taken with a tongues from off the altar and he laid it upon my mouth something from heaven will touch your mouth yeah. will touch your mind will touch your spirit will touch your you know there are people that come to the bible study and all they have is something entering their head entering uh, their brain and it doesn't touch their heart doesn't touch their mouth doesn't touch their mind doesn't touch their inner man but you know as the lord today as he's going to purge you i said as he's going to purge you something will happen to your inner man you become holier and more righteous and more gracious in jesus name and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this has touched my thy leaves and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged 
That's the Adamic nature. That is sin purged. That's the old man. That is sin purged. That's what he brought to this world. That is sin purged. After that, and also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, it's a new ministry now, a new ministry in your life. A new level in your life. Then said I, everybody, here am I, send me. We're looking at Malachi purging, purging, purging for more fruit. We're looking at Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 3. Malachi chapter 3, we're looking at verse 3. The poaching that produces more fruit, the poaching that produces a, a more closeness to the Lord. It says in Malachi chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 3, and he shall see it as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and poach them and poach them and poach them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. You see that when he purges, it's so that you'll be closer to him. You'll be cleaner. You'll be more righteous. You'll be holier. And he says then you'll be able to offer an um, offering to the Lord in more righteousness. Then in verse 4, then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. He says uh, when he purges us by himself he says they will offer unto the lord something more glorious like in the former years like in the olden days we're looking at chapter 5 of first corinthians first corinthians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 7 first corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 put out therefore put out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lamb is saying is such your heart any leaven there such a life any leaven there and such your ministry and your service any leaven there such your attitude is there any leaven there put out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lamb as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, let us keep the feast, not of the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. As there was a purging, there's also pruning. If you know anything about uh, vine dressers, they will look at uh, they will look at the vines and they will look at uh, some redundant elements that came to the vine. It, these things we're talking about now in the pruning, they are not something poisonous. They are not evil. They are not sinful. They're just worthless. They're just useless. As a believer, you look at your life. As a believer, you see that I'm born again. I'm a child of God. There is no sin that is the, you know, descriptive sins we're talking about and the demonstrable sins we're talking about and the evil that can quantify and say this is evil, that is evil. But there are some things that are useless. There are some things that are worthless. There are some things that retard your progress in your attitude in your manners, in your habit, in your life. And it's like uh, these redundant elements, the Lord wants to prune them away so that all the things that are taking the sap and the nutrient and the energy and your life and your opportunities, taking everything away, they'll be pruned away in your life. I said they'll be pruned away in your life. Actually, as you look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30, here is something that God says he will do. And you understand in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, and I'm reading here from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 30, and we're reading from verse 6, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Look up here for a moment. A circumcision, a, the flesh, the extra flesh there that is there that God wants to circumcise is not poisonous. It's a, an extra flesh. 
It's not an evil sinner. You brought it into this world and you can, you can live a normal life even with that uh, extra flesh that is there. But you see, it's going to collect bacteria. And because it's going to collect bacteria, because of the sack there, that's why the Lord said, uh, you need to be free from this. And there are some habits that you know people have. There are some tendencies that people have. They need to be pruned away, pruned away, so that no bacteria from the devil will be collected in your life. No bacteria from, you know, the world will be collected in your life in Jesus' name. And look at verse 6. It says, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that she might live. Really live. Really live. You live the abundant life. You live a shining life. And look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 12. Matthew chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 12. It says in Matthew chapter 3 verse 12. It says whose fan is in his son. And he will thoroughly purge his floor. And gather the wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The chaff. It's not evil. Chaff is not poisonous. Only that it doesn't have any food value. Chaff, it doesn't have any, any nutrient. And there are some things in our lives like chaff. Chaff that should be burnt up. Chaff that is just occupying the place. And is even hiding the weed that should come forth in our lives. And it is the pruning that takes all that away. And I pray the Lord will give you understanding. Understanding in your personal life. And then you examine your life and you say, I thank God I'm born again. I thank God I'm a child of God. I thank God I'm bearing the fruit of repentance. But what is it like child in my life? What is it like that false skin that needs to be circumcised and taken away so that it will not be collecting bacteria in my spiritual life? What is it in my life that the Lord is looking up at? He wants to prune so that you will bear more fruit. I see people there by the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, you'll bear more fruit in Jesus' name. We're looking at, we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 21. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, that he is recognized your life, this is useless. Take it off. This is worthless. Take it off. This is covering your glory. Take it off. And this is limiting your usefulness. Cut it off. It may be the way you spend your time. Cut it up. It may be the way you are, you know, talking, 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 and you are talkative. And because of that, leak power is leaking away from your life. Take it up. It may be because of your interaction with, you know, the methods of the world, the policies of the world, and you are being drained and you are shallow. It says, take it up, vim, and therefore purge himself from these. It shall be a vessel unto honor. You'll be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful laws, youthful desires, but follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them that call on the, on the Lord out of a pure heart. In Philippians, uh, Paul the Apostle recognized something in his personal life. And he knew that if he was going to do what he had been called for, he was going to rise higher than any of his contemporaries. There must be some things, they're not sinful things, they're not bad things, they're just uh, things that will hinder more fruitfulness. And look at this uh, now. Uh, it tells us that the pruning for marvelous fruit, it tells us in Philippians chapter 3 verse 7. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. 
He said, when I was in the world, there were some things that were gained to me. Religion, it was a gain for me. And, uh, you know, all the zeal, it was gain for me. And the letters I could have, I could go to those authorities anytime. I was linked with those religious authorities. I could get to them anytime. It says, but all those things that were gain unto me, I counted them lost for Christ. Uh, you know, there, there are some people, it may be like, you know, your problem is you are spending so much time watching things and watching things, uh, you know, and, and the, the limit the time of your praying. It may be a game is going on in the community, and uh, you know, you see it before that uh, that thing, that box there, and you're watching the game. Who will say that that is sin? Who will say that that is evil? But you know, it is taking you away from your devotion, from that deep holiness, and from that deep interaction with the Lord, and you have, more, you have knowledge about what happens there, the game that they play over there the people that want that thing Paul the apostle said you know what I looked at my life and I saw that this single life I'm going to do something greater than anybody in my family had ever done and I'm looking at you you are going to do something greater something higher than any of your family members have ever done the Lord confirm it to your life in Jesus name are there some irrelevant things? Are there some worthless things? Are there some useless things that habitually you do? And these things, they hinder your progress and they hinder the favor of God upon your life. It says, I count them now as dung, as lost. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all all things and do count them, but don't uh, that I may win Christ. Already born again, you wanted more of Christ. More of Christ will come in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number two now, the peril and the perdition of apostate backsliders for their fruitlessness. We're coming back to, we're coming back to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 2, and I'm reading from verse 6. John chapter 15, look at verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he, the husband man, he, the vine dresser, he, my father, taketh away. Every branch in me, in me, that means they were born again. Every branch in me, that means they were connected with me. Every branch in me, this is not talking about somebody who has never heard the word of God. This is not talking about somebody who has never repented. This is not talking about somebody who has never attended a church service. This is not talking about somebody who has never heard the gospel. They've heard of Christ a savior and they have even made a profession of being children of God but the only problem with them is that the fruitless the fruit of the spirit is not there and the fruit of repentance is not there and the fruit of righteousness is nowhere to be found in their lives every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away look at verse 6 verse 6 if a man abide not in me if a man abide not in me you understand he's talking to his own disciples they were in Christ they were abiding in Christ but now they slide back and they move away if a man abide not in me he's cast forth as a branch you see there are people that say once you belong to Christ you always belong to Christ once you're saved you're forever saved and they say there's no danger at all even if you go out of Christ even if you live like the devil even if if you live like a terrible sinner a wicked man you said once saved always saved Jesus said, don't listen to those people because if a branch, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And then it says, and men gathered them and cast them into the kingdom and cast them into paradise. Tell me, into the fire. And they are burnt. You know, this kind of people, number one, 
the profession of false believers. The profession of false believers. There are people that say, I'm in Christ. Don't look at my character. I'm in Christ. Don't look at my behavior. I'm in Christ. I know I'm in Christ. Nobody will make me to doubt that. Don't look at what I do. I know inside me. You may not see. You may not know that I belong to Christ, but I belong to Christ. And they are false professors. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 6. Titus chapter 1, we're reading from verse 16. They profess that they know God. Every branch in me that beareth no fruit, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. You see that these people who are they are loud in their testimony. And they're loud when you, you try to tell them, my friend. If you were really in Christ, I about this uh, fighting all the time, I about this violence, I about this anger, I about this stealing, I about this evil that you're doing. You don't show that you belong to Christ. They say, don't, don't criticize me, don't condemn me. I know if you don't know that I'm in Christ, I know that I'm in Christ. But you are not bearing fruit. Leave that alone. No, we cannot leave that alone because every branch in me that beareth no fruit, he taketh away. They profess that they know God, but they are reprobate and they are not bearing the fruit they ought to be. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, the profession of false, false, false believers. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 5, having a form of godliness, having a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, leading with sins, led away with uh, diverse laws, ever learning, ever learning, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning about salvation, and the fruit of salvation is not there. Ever learning about repentance, and the genuine repentance you cannot find. Ever learning about Christ, the Savior, the Sanctifier, the Baptizer, in the Holy Ghost, and all the gifts and all the things that Christ wants to give, the grace is not there. Ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of of the truth in James chapter 2. James chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 17. James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Those people say, I have faith, saving faith, but there's no work. There's no fruit. It says it's dead. Look at verse 20. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? dead. Look at verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Number one, the profession of false believers. Number two, the peril of fruitless branches. The peril of fruitless branches. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15 we're reading from verse 2. In John chapter 15, reading here from verse 2. It says, every branch in me, every branch in me, he professes to know the Lord. Every branch in me that beareth no fruit, he taketh away. He taketh away. It's not referring to Satan. See, Satan is not the one taking away here. It's the Lord himself. It's the vine dresser himself. It's the almighty God. This one is just occupying the ground for nothing. This one is just being attached to the vine for nothing. You know? And it's not bearing fruit. He taketh away. He taketh away. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. Who are the people that he takes away? What kind what kind of people, what kind of branches are taken away from the vine? It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, and it says, Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, What did they say? Or not walk 
bearing. You say you are born again. You say you are a child of God. You say you are connected to Christ. You say you are converted. You say you are on your way to heaven. All right now, as for the old way, as for the old path, as for the word of God, not the modern day a kind of psychedelic Christianity, not the modern useless uh, form of Christianity that doesn't show any good behavior and any good evidence of being born again. Look for the old way and walk in it and you shall find rest unto your soul. But he said, well, we'll not walk there in verse 17 also. I said, watch men over you, saying, hacking to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, what did they say? We well, will not hacking. Therefore, therefore, hear ye nations and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people. Even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. You see, that's what the Lord said they will do. That's why Jesus was asking the question in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 46. Luke chapter 6. Reading from verse 46. In verse 46, and why call ye me Lord, Lord? And do you know the things which I say? What do you say you are attached to me? What do you say you are connected with me? What do you say you are converted to me? And yet you do not hear, and you do not do the things which I say. Look at verse 49. But he that heareth and doeth not. He that heareth and doeth not is like is like a man that uh, without uh, without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Hebrews chapter six, Hebrews chapter six, reading from verses seven and eight. Hebrews 6, verses 7 and 8. It says in verse 7, But the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh up upon it, bringeth forth herbs, meat for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars, is rejected and is nice to cursing whose end is to be whose end is to be burnt. Number one, the, pro the profession of false believers. Number two, the peril of fruitless branches. Number three, the perdition of forsaking backsliders. Understand? When somebody backslides, the Spirit of God will be pleading with that individual. Come back. Get back. Repent. Return. So you can be restored. God does not want you to perish in the backsliding. If that person persists in backsliding, and God is just saying, come, come, and he keeps in that backsliding condition until the end of his life, then he's forsaking. And the goodness of God will not flow to him anymore. Uh, look at chapter 15, uh, verse 6. Chapter 15, verse 6 of John. If a man abide not in me. Uh, you know, in the case of Peter, he backslid, he did not abide, but he repented. And the Lord received him. And if you're a backslider tonight, you can come back to the Lord before it's too late. And the Lord will receive every backslider in Jesus' name. Amen. But if the person remains in backsliding, and he wants to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And eventually he dies in that condition. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. And is withered. And men gathered them and cast them into, into what? Tell me out aloud. Into the fire and they are burnt. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 verse 9 and verse 10. Matthew chapter 3. 
We're reading from verses 9 and 10. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, it says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which beareth not forth good fruit is hewn down, is cut down, and cast into, tell me, into fire. Look at chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7. And we're reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns, of figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. If you're really born again, you don't be bringing out lying, deception, stealing, fighting, adultery, fornication. A good tree, you are converted, you are transformed, your life will be totally transformed. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit and every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down tell me what follows and is cast into the fire Matthew chapter 13 we're reading from verse 14 Matthew chapter 13 we're reading from verse 14 it says as therefore the tires are gathered and burnt in the fire so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out from the gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. All things that offend. There are some people they just choose to be offensive every time. There's no provocation. They choose to be offensive every time. There's no temptation even. And they choose to be offensive any time. They just delight. They just enjoy being offensive. And it says at the end of time, if they don't repent, the Lord will send his angels and he will call out, he will cast out, he will take away the things that offend and them that do iniquity. And it says in verse 42, and they shall cast them into the furnace of what? Into the furnace of fire. These are the words of Jesus Christ. And they, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 26. It says in verse 26, For if we sin willfully, Hey, this is somebody that, you know, he says, I belong to Christ. He says, I'm born again. He says, I'm a child of God. And he says, you know, I know the standard of the word. I know about righteousness. I know about holiness. But I just want to, I just want to do it, you know. And when I do this, somebody will complain. I like them to complain. I like them to criticize. I like them to, you know, get, I want to get on their nerves. He says, I want to see how their reaction will be. And because of that they sin presumptuously for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and and great and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries he that despised Moses law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sorrow punishment greater punishment more terrible uh, punishment a fiercer kind of punishment uh, suppose he shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the son of god and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified he was saved was separated from the world he was sanctified this is a believer who had come back fully and completely full strength and full length into the world 
and deliberately is, uh, you know, kind of uh, rolling in sin and doing evil. And now it comes the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite to the spirit of grace. For we know him that has said vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. But start one, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I pray that will not be your Lord. I said that will not be your Lord. Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 12. In Jude chapter 1 verse 12, these are spots in your feasts of charity. The backsliding, and they come in and out in the midst of the people of God. And, uh, you know, they are pastors and they are leaders. And uh, those who love them, they try to tell them, look at your life. Christ can come at any time. But they shrug it off. They don't care about, you know, about uh, doctrine. They don't care about the word of God anymore. Uh, they come to study. They come to revival. They come to Sunday service. And they come to all the meetings of the believers. But these are sports in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves uh, without fear, and clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit twice dead. That is, they were dead in trespasses and sins before they were saved. They died all over again, and that's uh, the second time uh, they are dead. It says twice dead, plucked up by the roots, reaching waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. And then it goes on to say, wandering stars, they wander from assembly to assembly, from location to location. They wander from denomination to denomination because uh, uh, their mind is not steady anymore. And it says, they are wandering stars to whom is reserved. The blackness of darkness for how long? Forever. I pray that you will not be your Lord. I didn't hear the people say amen. amen. Revelation chapter 20. Judgment is coming on the final day. Revelation chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 10. Revelation chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 10. And it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Where the devil is, these uh, forsaken backsliders, they'll be there eventually. But thank God I will not be there. Look at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found uh, no more place, no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. And I saw the dead, young and old. And I saw the dead dead, little, and big. And I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, and according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged. Judgment is coming, and they were judged. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the final death, the ultimate death, the irretrievable death, the irrevocable death. Once this happens, that will be forever and ever in verse 15, and whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life tell me what follows was cast into the lake of fire thank god i will not be there i said thank god i will not be there i will be a fruit by grace i'll be a fruit by the love of god i'll be a fruit the enablement of god i will be a fruit by the goodness of god upon my life i will be a fruit the lord confirms your desire in jesus name 
We we'll come to point number three now, the preparation and the preservation of abiding believers for much fruitfulness. Abiding, abiding believers for much fruitfulness. We're looking at it from verse three now, from verse three now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You know, he was talking to some disciples, he said, None of you is uh, with that branch at present. None of you is cut off from connection with me at present because now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Look at verse 4. Abide in me, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. As you look at those three verses, three things. Number one, purity through cleansing by Christ. Purity through cleansing by Christ. It says in verse 3, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. We need that purity to get to heaven. We need that cleansing to get to heaven. It tells us in Psalm 24, Psalm 24 verses 3 and 4. In verse, Psalm 24 verses uh, 3 and 4, it says, uh, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And which all shall stand in his holy place. He that has clean hands, your hands are not sticky. You're not stealing money from your office. You're not stealing money from the offering bag. It says, he that has clean hands, you're not committing abortion. Your hand is not defiled with blood. He that has clean hands, you have no part in the destruction of any life in any way. You're not doing something that is uh, going to destroy anybody's life. Maybe the life of unborn babies, your hands are clean. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, those are the people that are going to heaven. Clean hands, the salvation the salvation, pure heart, the sanctification. I pray the Lord will affirm it and confirm it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Look at this, that she might sanctify and cleanse it. He wants us clean. He wants us pure. He wants us purged. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The word of God we're hearing should keep our lives clean. And thank God this word, the water of the word, will keep you clean in Jesus' name. That he might present you to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's you. I said that's you. The blood will cleanse you completely in Jesus' name. Look at First John chapter 1, First John chapter 1, we're reading from verse 5. First John chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we we'll lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of who? Of Jesus Christ, his son. What does he do? Cleanseth us from all sin. Number two here, the priority of continuing in Christ. The priority of continuing in Christ. We're coming to John chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 4 john chapter 15 we're reading from verse 4 abide in me continue with him and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me the secret of bearing more fruit and much fruit and marvelous fruit and manifold fruit is that we abide in him we continue with him you will continue. I will continue. You will not be separated from Christ. I said you will not be separated from Christ. 
Look at John chapter 8, John chapter 8, and verse 31. John chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue, if ye continue, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Somebody there, you will continue. I said you will continue. You know, there, there are people that misunderstand the promise of God. And they say, God has said, uh, those who come to me, I will in no wise cast off. And, and I've come to Christ. And even since I have come, whatever happens, uh, what, even if I don't abide, even if I don't remain, I'll still be all right. Will he be all right? Will she be all right? Uh, let me show you something in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27. Acts chapter 27, I'm reading here from verse 22. Acts chapter 27, Acts chapter 27, verse 22. Look at this, very important. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the sheep. There shall be no loss of any life among you. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God has given thee all them that sail with thee. That means they're saved, they're secured. But look at verse 31. Look at verse 31. In verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the sheep, ye cannot be saved. You see that? As you look at verse 22, all through to verse 24, you see the promise of God. And he says, I've given you one of them. None of them will be lost. And now before they got to the shore, some of them wanted to play some game. And they wanted to, you know, have loss into their own hands. And Paul, the apostle said, hey, hold on. Except these abide in the sheep, ye cannot be saved. That means the promise of God as a condition. You will fulfill that condition. You will abide. I said you will abide. And the Lord will keep your life in Jesus' name. Number three, the proof of consecration to Christ. The proof of consecration to Christ. John chapter 15. We're looking at verse 5. I am the vine. And ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth, tell me, much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible for you. You can do all things. You will do all things. You will abide. And the grace of God will be multiplied in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. The Lord is talking about bearing fruit. We come to Christ. We are converted by Christ. We're connected to Christ. We continue with Christ. We're consecrated to Christ. And thank God you'll be a fruit bearing branch all through your lives in Jesus' name. More grace is available today. More favor is available today. More goodness is available today. And the Lord wants you to get nearer and closer. And the strength and the grace to bear fruit, it will supply in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Get nearer to God. Get closer to God. He'll give you more grace today. Please stand up and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, here am I. More grace today. More grace today. More grace today. More grace today. He will do it in your life. He will do it in your life. He loves you. He loves you. And he wants his grace to multiply in your life. If you're weak, tell the Lord. He'll make you strong. If you're looking back, tell the Lord. He will refocus you. If anything is happening and it looks like you're not bearing fruit, 
why don't you call upon the Lord more fruit is available much fruit is available the hand of the Lord will be with you you will not die by the wayside you will grow you'll bear more fruit call upon the Lord more grace available today for everyone